Hi, I'm Caroline Kepnes, and welcome to The Sarah O'Connell Show. Welcome to The Sarah O'Connell Show. Caroline Kepnes, welcome to The Sarah O'Connell Show. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good, thank you. It's cold, but it's the Sex in the City is back, and it's a, it's a nice Thursday, and I've been writing, and I'm good. And you? Uh, pretty much the same. It's always cold in England. I'm looking right. forward to watching the new Sex in the City spin-off tonight. I've downloaded the first two episodes, ready to go. And I'm really excited to talk to you about you and also about you. But before we get started with all of that, can you please tell me, when you were growing up in Massachusetts, what did you aspire to be? Um, sometimes a dancer, often a writer. I think I just always like, do you remember the Richard Scary books, What Do People Do All Day? Mm, yeah, of I course. felt overwhelmed by like, just c- couldn't wait to be an adult and be a part of the world. And what that meant, like took on different things, depending on what I was into. But I always loved writing stories and making things up. And so I thought I'll find a way to play with my dollhouse and get paid for it. And I feel like that's kind of where I am. <laughs> I love that. And so after graduating, you were offered a job at a law firm. You instead ended up working at the Museum of Natural History in New York. That must have been a lot of fun. I am impressed you did your research. I do indeed. Yes. And with that law firm, I mean, there were so many interviews. It was such a process. I feel like I was already missing the structure of college and school and having those, you know, the the deadlines, the work. And I remember it hitting me that like work at a law firm so you can go to law school. And it was so single minded. And the day I was supposed to start, I just called them and backed out with no plan, with no apartment, with no, you know knowing of what to do, but it was the American Museum of Natural History was a wonderful place to land. I bet it was. And now we're reaching this point very early, but I think this is going to be my most important question. You saw an advert looking for a writer for Tiger Beat magazine writing about boy bands. Can you tell me your favorite boy band of all time? I mean, New Kids on the Block. Like they, I knew about them early from growing up on yeah. Cape Cod and, you know, they're Boston and Joey McIntyre was like just an awakening for me of like, I just loved them and seeing them was life altering. My parents were concerned because I was that kid with the posters all over the walls. And it was like, I loved them so much. It was hard to sleep and hard to do much else, but it comes in handy years later when I, you know, work at Tiger Beat and feel like, yeah, you know, there's when you're young and you get obsessed with something, I think. You, it's like that energy is there and it finds a place to go and vroom. <laughs> and then, of course, years later, they did the ultimate collaboration with Backstreet Boys and I think became NKOTBSB. That's right. Yes. And it helped me because then when I was making the Tiger Beat decision, I'd been offered a position at a Condé Nast magazine that was, um, I think, was House and Garden. And I'm just not, it's not my speed. And the Condé Nast was like the right decision. And my friends were like, there's no debate here. Like it's Condé Nast. Like you get in there, it's everything. (laughs) But at the time, the song I Want It That Way was big. And, you know. (laughs) It's still big in this house now. I I listen to it most days. It's it's an incredible song. The nice house you have there. (laughs) It's the best. Only has one song is the only thing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) So is it true you're also a background extra in a TV show called The Street? Yes, I was. Yes. So that was, I'm like, that was in between, oh, time. I'm like, the older I get, the more confusing it is. But (laughs) it was in between Tiger Beat and Entertainment Weekly. And I had odd jobs. I danced on the show Direct Effects sometimes and worked on the street. And I loved being in that atmosphere and, you know, pretending to be a like secretary. And it was at the time that Sex in the City was shooting. So it was close to be around all of that. It was a very exciting time. And But I was, you know, it was good that I got a job at Entertainment Weekly, too, because that's very true. Yeah, Street was canceled and, you know. Most unnecessary. See, I did some background extra work at one point, too. But so I was wondering, I used to create elaborate backstories for these characters that were never given any dialogue. Did you used to do the same with yours? You'd imagine who they are and perhaps who they're married. Yes, especially like, I don't know about you, but it was so rare for the most part. It was just sitting. But there was one day when I was I got to walk and I had a cue and I didn't have a line or anything. But I remember like, you know, building it all of like, you know, what was going on for her that day, why she was bringing the coffee. And yes, it's... (laughs) I think that's, you know, when you're a writer, you're always just ha- like you're turning everything into a writing moment. Exactly. And you also wrote a biography, your first book, I believe, for Stephen Crane. How did that come about? 
Yes, that I think that that was another like either Craigslist or I was going to say eBay, but no, not eBay. But um, <laughs> do you remember Media Bistro? Yeah. At that time, there were there would be ads on there. It came from either Craigslist or Media Bistro, and it was a children's publisher. And it was like a great like that was when I was wanting to move to L.A. and I wasn't ready and I wanted like something to do. And I loved like just going on this deep dive and learning everything about him and rereading those books. And yes amazing and you also wrote two episodes of seventh heaven were you a fan of that show I was I mean I when I worked at entertainment weekly they teased me because I was an assistant in the tv department and it was like my job I was constantly saying okay but what about seventh heaven what about seventh heaven and they're like you know it wasn't that kind of a show that was written about it and it didn't mean like my editor didn't think it made sense that it was like my favorite thing but for me it was a black comedy like the, yeah. the close-ups of the dog I also like anything with a very specific language so I was absolutely obsessed with it and got a kick out of it and I wrote about comparing the family to the Osbournes um that show was on MTV at the time and then the showrunner sent me flowers so I sent her scripts like <laughs> because she liked the article and it was like yeah <laughs> you asked for it you know <laughs> now in 2012 you wrote and directed a short film which I haven't seen yet but I really want to called Miles Away which is about a tennis mom that befriends a man who not only believes in aliens but he claims that they come and visit every Monday yes and that was on Indiegogo is that correct yes mm -hmm. and I, I feel like I should put the link out there I mean I'll send it to you but I when you it's so it's not on YouTube or yeah okay. I've seen the trailer Yes, I'll do that. Um, yeah, I'd written a short story. The short story was called Miles Away. And I had come off of working on Secret Life, the American Teenager. And I wanted to do something on my own. And I never directed anything. I mean, I directed plays in college, but it, it started out, I feel like anyone who's ever made a short film knows it was like, this will just be a quick little enterprise of a few friends getting together. And months later, you're like, oh my God, my debt it's not done. And it's, you know, it's just, yes. but um, yeah, I, the story is a, a mom, it's her perspective, her POV. And she has this daughter who she just doesn't relate to. And the daughter is very, very vicious and just going through that teenage place, which I feel like also she's a competitive athlete. Mm -hmm. And I think it's hard to go from the court into a car with your mother when you've lost. And I, I used to play tennis and hopefully I wasn't as harsh as the character is, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, the tennis coach, he, the mom feels kind of ignored and lost in her life. And he invites her to go up with these aliens. And it's kind of, for me, the theme is a bit like the, you can either choose to assume someone is crazy and lonely mm -hmm. and making up things, but there's that part of you that wants to believe and being torn between the possibility of magic and the reality of crazy, which is, I guess, a theme in a lot of my writing. <laughs> well, it looks like a lot of fun and I really can't wait to watch it. <laughs> now I've waited long enough I have to talk to you of course about you can you tell me the inspirations for the book and Joe Goldberg where did that come from did you know anybody like that yeah I unfortunately I didn't know anybody like that but I think especially with that like I'd, I'd written things before but with that kind of undertaking it feels like it's from so many different parts of your life right like when I was in high school I had my, this great guidance counselor who had me take a intelligence test and I did well. And I got to go to this intense psych program. And I've just, my mom found my report card from it where they're like, she likes thinking, but like, basically it was like, she likes thinking from both sides of the, you know, the killer, the person with the problems and what that's like for everyone. And when I looked at that, I'm like, yeah, like that was when as a young writer, it clicked for me that I liked writing about people who like, how, who don't see things as, as we normals yeah. would see them. And then I'd gone through so much loss, like on a, on a grand scale, I lost my father. We had a business, our family that was gone. I wasn't working. I had emergency throat surgery and had to be in silence. And that was really something because I still have all the notepads where like you go to meet friends and you write something down and they look at you and you realize how much tone of voice matters and your intonation. And I, I, sometimes I think more and more like that, that was a big part of it because mm -hmm. when I look at these notepads and think if someone found these, like I sound like the most terrible person and I'm trying to make jokes and they're not coming off. And then, I, yeah, then the Joe of it was like, also I had quit smoking 
And I had, and it was like a wonderful thing to do, but it leaves you with this like gnawing frustration. Mm -hmm. And ultimately I'm feeling I'm going on and on in the simplest way. Like when someone you love dies and the goneness of it Mm -hmm. and the way that voice doesn't come back to you. I was like, if I make up a voice, it won't die unless I kill it. And then I kind of liked the idea of making him a sort of cancer that will survive everything. Right. Because that was one of those thoughts. I feel like I had a lot while dealing with cancer, like the idea that like this thing, you know, like my dad was terminal, you know how it's going to work out and it doesn't mean you don't have to deal with it. And it doesn't mean that there aren't also wonderful close moments with your family and with, you know, that are sad and beautiful, but yeah, I feel like Joe was my working around cancer. So years later, it's something to still be like, waking up every day and going into that head and brought back into that very dark time. (laughs) Absolutely. And so Joe, of course, works in a bookstore and he's also a stalker and a serial killer. Is it difficult striking that balance so that the audience wants to go with this anti-hero on his journey? I think so. I mean, I, when I was writing that first book, I would talk to friends about it and they would get confused and say, wait, you told me you were writing about this, like, really like devoted reader bookseller. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. But, but then he met someone who was cruel to someone and they're like, so he's a murderer. I'm like, no. And I, I, it's this, for me, it's a constant fine line between remember coming back to how he thinks Mm -hmm. and also to like all the many crimes of that there are in this world, that the little crimes that add up. And I, I always think of him as like, reacting in a way that none of us do but we emotionally feel that so I think about that a lot in every scene and thinking okay like I need this person to be like not comically over the top bad where they feel invented just to give him something to do but at the same time that's the magic of his perspective and I love that like he's such a narcissist that that there's just a scene in the new book where he's thinking about like he's so obsessed with this you know woman he's with he's like it's not narcissism if you're in it with someone else and you're both obsessed with each other then and I'm like yeah that's his problem but when you're in that there's that little part of you that's all like sees you as the star of the show as the leader of your life and like I just heard something on the radio the other day I love local radio where you know they always talk about those studies and a study some percentage of people that think that their life is interesting enough to be a book and the radio DJs were like shocked at how high it was and I was like no like we all I'm not surprised that that statistic is high. And for me, yeah, it's always about bringing the reader like where they can't help but understand what it feels like when you think the world is against you. I suppose though, to be fair to literally everyone on the planet, they they know themselves better than everyone else does. So Mm -hmm. while, while we may know people on sort of a superficial level, they know everything they've ever done, everything they've ever hoped to achieve, gotten away with, all of that stuff. Yes, yes. And there's something I feel like, so many, as I'm writing with every book, it's like all of the, the dark side of, of all of the good things we're told and not only about relationships, but about ourselves. I'm like, Joe is like really good at self-care, you know? And I, part of the nightmare also is always like with that first book, like if someone saw everything you say and do, none of us would look great. And right. that's kind of the car- the doom of every love story that like he's bound to be disappointed because any, no one man or woman is, you're going to look at every single thing they've ever written in that phone and say, yes, a plus human all the time. And that's why we have privacy and boundaries, which I'm a big fan of. And for me, the more I write, it's like, yeah, he's very much like this reminder of why boundaries are good and why we are all a little mysterious in a good way. And also be careful what you put on the internet. Yes. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) I'd love to know more about your creative process. Do you give yourself a certain word count you have to reach every day? Do you have a favorite place you like to write? You know, everyone's different about that. I, I like, I'm a sofa person. So I just like to sit up on the sofa. And sometimes I like when I, I think of it as building and, you know, drafting can be like the most hellish thing in the world. It's the ultimate facing the blank page and learning to say it's not supposed to be perfect. And I'm writing this so that I have something to play with. So I get through that phase of like making the chapter and then I leave it alone. And then I love when you come back a day later and you're like, oh, I know what this is. And then comes the fevered flow that like the romance part of the writing, you know, where it's just all pouring out. But for me, like I have to, it's very like, uh, like just, it has to be a habit. It has to, I just have to go and do it and keep Mm -hmm. doing it. 
in order to get to that part of the flow. And when I'm in it, I like to go like every day, not every day, like I'll, I'm trying, especially this year to like, I'm going to have a weekend, you know, like I'm going to not think about Joe for two days, but then I go out and in this world now someone's like, oh my God, the show. And I'm like, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, this is my time away from Joe. It's true. So do you kind of have the same problem Joe has in a way and that you can't stop thinking about Joe? Yeah, it's, it's hard that way. Cause especially like I stay off social media a lot because everything I see, like, it's so fun to take everything and put it into it and expose him to it. Yeah. So, and everything makes me think, oh my God, this could happen for him. This could happen for him. Like how, what would he think of this? And in that way too, it makes me very like weird about sharing myself because I didn't do it. Like, I feel like, yeah, we all do it more, especially the pandemic and everything, but I have this constant, not only like critical voice in my head, because it was one of those, the most fun things about that first book was him just tearing apart her Twitter and like making fun of her. And it's continued to be in every book. So I say anything, I hear him like, oh God, you know, like (laughs) mocking it. And also I'm like, oh, I'm, you know, putting myself out there. And then I'm like, calm down. This is what people do. Like, it's not, he's not real. And, but yeah, it's, I never spent this much time with a character in my life. And it's, yeah, it's a, it's a long time. Uh, It's a fun character to spend a lot of time with. Absolutely. As long as you're doing it from a distance as a viewer or a reader. Yes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like this summer I went to, I was at a Dunkin' Donuts with my brother and there's a, this next book is set in Boston. And I've been thinking a lot about, you know, like what's inside of a Dunkin' Donuts and murder. And, and my brother said, just ask. And I'm like, no, no, no. And I said to the guy, like, do you have an oven? Like, can I see if I can fit in there? And he's like, what? (laughs) And he, you know, he doesn't know us. And I'm like, oh, this is my brother. It's not normal. But he takes us downstairs and my brother's explaining like she writes books like it's not you know we're not going to kill anyone and yeah I could fit in there like it's yeah which wow. I thought from reading about them and looking online and like zooming in on videos of like behind the scenes at Duncan's and I don't even know if it'll be in the book but it's like that kind of a thing of like going out into the world is fun to have I think it's part of the fun of writing murder books <laughs> <laughs> and I know one of the writers of the Saw movies and he has said that sometimes when he's researching things just from a technical point of view as you did with that oven like he must worry about what his google searches are like yes yes Mm -hmm. and that's a it's part of there's a story regarding that in the um in the next joe book because i i think it's fascinating that like it's such a license as a profession to look up and go anywhere you want to go and i like that's where like things like the dark web intrigue me because i'm like in theory like i could probably go on the dark web that I still don't fully understand what it is, but I like, I just saw a movie where the guy takes out a fake keypad, you know what I mean? Like, (laughs) and I'm like, and I, yeah, I, since I have proof that this is what I do, I wouldn't be suspicious. And that fundamentally is kind of scary because it's a slippery slope for, it's possible to imagine someone else where it was a slippery slope, which is, yeah. Exactly. Now I must ask you this question and apologies in advance, but do you have, or do you know anyone that has a giant plastic box in their basement? Oh, well, no, I don't. But when I worked at a bookstore, (laughs) the basement was quite something. There were just hundreds of books. It was like the, made me think of like old ships and like you would go like at the bottom of an old ship, like it had, and the owner didn't know what was in there. And it was this magical creepy basement. And our friend's family had a restaurant next door and they had kind of a cage situation that had just been there when they got it. And it was probably like a safe and, but yeah, I'm like uh, basements. I feel like it's a new England thing. I just love basements. I go to anyone's house. It's the first place I want to go. I'm like, it's just metaphorically, like, I feel like there's a reason so many books and stories for so long have, you know, basements in them. Mm. But fortunately, no, I don't know anyone that has a (laughs) cage, but I, and for me, that was from, it was the silence of the lambs. It was my favorite thing about that story, like the book and the movie, like just watching them with that boundary and thinking of it always as like a romantic thing to have the divide, like the woman saying goodbye to the man on the train Mm. to turn it into a place of like, thank God for this because he really understands her. And I, and there might be a moment where she forgets all the evil that he does. And (laughs) can you tell me how the TV show first came about? Because the first season was on Lifetime. How did they approach you with this idea of adapting it into a show? Yeah. Like it started as like, it felt like a book club on crack where Greg Berlanti, um, who does so much, like found the time to read the book and loved it. And he gave it to Sarah Gamble and she loved it. And they had this like fevered reaction to it. And I went in to meet with them and it was like, 
yeah, like book club on crack. And they were so determined to like be faithful and like capture that the essence of the book and the claustrophobia and Lee Tolan Krieger, the greatest guy who's the, the director, like was all about getting the lens right and the making it look and feel like the book. And it was so exciting to have that all happening. And so, and Lifetime were just the best people. It was just magical. And then, you know, like it comes out and it's every Sunday and the ratings aren't great. And it looks like it's going to go away. And I'm so grateful that like, I met, you know, the actor, like everyone involved in it was just wonderful. And you know, in this business, like something gets optioned, it's very rare that it makes it to the screen. Yeah. So I'm like this beautiful show and they're going to put it on Netflix. Oh, that's good. Like, that's fun. More people will see it. And then like <laughs> crazy, like to have suddenly the whole, like millions of people, like numbers that I will never process, like just not only like devouring it, but like knowing who Joe is, who was like my imaginary friend. I'm like, <laughs> what is happening? It's still, yeah. And what did you think of the, the casting of Penn Badgley as Jay and just seeing your character brought to life as well? It's terrific. It's wild. And I think he's so smart and he's sensitive. And also like he is a reader. Like for me, it's that like when he's holding a book, you don't feel like he's acting. And you can tell that like, yeah, he knows his way around books. That was one of those things that I felt very aware of in the early casting of like, yeah, it's TV. They're going to want someone hot. But I'm like, let's face it. Like a lot of people don't read. And when they hold a book, it's going to like, it won't feel like they're a book person. Cause I'm like, Joe, that book love for me was so important and to have the authenticity. And I think Penn is so great with that. And you feel like that he's, he's got that side of him and the voiceover. Cause that's a scary thing too. It's one of those, they warn you about being reliant on voiceover. Mm -hmm. And I was like, when I think of the book, all it is is voiceover because it's Joe's internal letter to that woman. And I feel like they captured that well. And it's it's magic to see him, someone pretending to be him. Yeah, it's really interesting because I, I realized when I watched the show back that there's some scenes that are just narration. So he's performing that scene in silence. Yeah. And then the narration's happening after it. Yes. And I like silent film, like, and I've always liked montages. So I I just I like that kind of acting. And I feel like he's, I, you know, I don't think that there would be a million memes if everyone didn't feel like compelled. And the other difference is that like just the, you know, what TV brings to something like for me, reading a book is reading any book is an immersive experience. It's you mm. and the book and you're relating, you're not doing something else while you're doing it. So it's like a psychological study when you're reading it because you're in his head and you know that. And in the show, suddenly you're watching him. So you're less inside of him. So then when there's all of that controversy of like, is he a hero? I'm like, oh yeah, these are two different, like on the show, it's TV. Of course, they're going to get a, you know, cute guy and he's going to be charming. And I don't know. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's a <laughs> lot to keep up with. And so obviously you wrote the first book before the show came out, but now that the show exists and the characters are well-known and well-loved, when you're writing subsequent books, do you think of the characters with the actors in mind or how you originally envisioned them? I don't. I mean, when I'm writing books, like, I almost have to be like, I remember in the first book, I had to be like the editors, like, and you know, more physical description here. Like I'm very voice oriented and I mm. hear things more than I see them. And I just, and it's like the voice and the emotions. So I know writers who can like, when they're writing a book, will like print out pictures of actors and see it that way. I'm just not that way. Or I'll see like something old that I loved, like taxi driver. I remember when they were casting, I'm like, well, I like taxi driver. Like, you know, but I'm like, it's, I would also go out in the world and be like, that's Joe, that's Joe, that's Peach. Like, depending on how my interaction with someone was and how I felt yeah. being around them. So I, I'd written the first two books when the show started. And then I had, I took time off. I wrote Providence and then kind of cracking my knuckles and going back into Joe for you love me was a wild experience because it was my first time, not only writing a third book, but my first time writing with the show in the world. And it was kind of like, okay, those parties were all fun. There's a team of people making that show now. They're they're doing their thing and I'm going to go do mine. And so I it was the same kind of thing, like of just going for his voice and yes, not picturing actors. But that's what was hard in the first season when they're so good. And I'm, I remember saying like, Shane Mitchell as Peach was phenomenal. I'm like, maybe he doesn't have to kill her. And they're like, this is the book. Like, yes, he does. <laughs> this is what he does. I'm like, ah, this is why I like books because it's all, you know, it's fiction. 
Absolutely. Um, so speaking of which, how closely would you say the TV show follows the books? And do you think they, that the show will continue to into the future? I mean, for me, that's in season two, when they changed the DNA of love and made Love Quinn into, I, I don't want to give, I know it's also so funny with spoilers, like the, the, the anti-spoiler energy in me is like large of being afraid to ruin <laughs> books or shows for anyone, but they changed the nature of their relationship. So for me, the, sh- the show naturally like went on a different path. And I think you put those writers together for years. They're working. Joe is so fun. If I was in that room, I'd want to play and mess with him too. So I, the books and well, I, I keep like staying to my plans and then they're making their plans based on the way Joe has grown in their world. So you're now a consulting producer on the show. Can you tell me what that actually involves? Yeah, I mean, in the first season, so I, again, like having written those two books and writing Providence, something, you know, like completely separate from Joe, I went in, I wrote an episode of you, I was like able to visit the set, and it was also pre, you know, COVID time, so it was like nice together time, but then when I got, which I was so happy, like to get to write more Joe books, I've stepped, taken a big step back, because Mm -hmm. I just can't, like, it's just me, but I can't, like, live in that world, and then go to my Joe, and it's too much. Yeah. <laughs> in season three, Joe says that things are going to be different this time. And he is seemingly making a conscious effort to not do bad things wherever possible. Do you think it's possible for Joe to be a redeemable character? I mean, for like in You Love Me, like it's a, a similar situation where Joe decides like for that the American justice system is very unfair. And it was it was something that I loved because it was so hard to like wrap your head around all the rationalizations that some of which are good and bad, but like, in essence, he's not being good because he feels guilty for what he did, but he's living in reality. He no longer has a wealthy family to back him up. So in the book, he just sort of gets people to fall prey to their own demons. And I loved that strategy of like finding a way to still do what he does, but to do it in a way that he could say, you know what, like, everyone on this planet has problems. And if they're faced with them or put alone with them, a lot of people get weak. And how odd, and to me, somehow that's kind of worse than murder of like setting people up and pushing them to the brink. Mm. But at the same time, like these people were doing some not very nice things. So I think it's like in with the Joe books for me, it's always relative. And it's also like his value system always is going to start with him having been denied certain things that he wants and feeling like that didn't that like hit that the way that the world denied him of things that's on the world <laughs> and have you got a favorite scene from one of your books or indeed the show that you really loved um I'm well I'm I feel like I'm not right like I'm so into you four that I'm doing right now and there's a biking scene that I'm just like obsessed with and I don't ride bikes so I think that's part of it that like because I don't do that. I was like, I really wanted to feel like he's on a bike. And I talked to a couple of friends who did. And now I'm like, I just love it. And then from the books that are out there, it's like for nostalgic purposes, I just love Joe and Beck's first date in the book. It made me so happy because Corner Bistro was one of my favorite places and the David Bowie rare and well done album, like to see all those favorite things of my life, like used for sick purposes. in my book was really nice. And in Hidden Bodies, I just love when he's taking down Henderson, that was one of those things in the book that, yeah, that was like very cathartic and nice to write. And then you love me. I love when he's realizes something about Mary Kay that he didn't want to see. And So we're speaking about the fourth book now, of course, what can you tell me about the book? How far into it are you? Do you have a title yet? Do you know when we might be able to read it? I wrote a first draft in 2020 and I, as soon as I finished, I'm like, this is it. This is it. And I send it like, ah, this is it. And I feel like I might've said that online. And then a day goes by, like the the dreams start coming where it's just dreams of just pages. And I'm like, no, no, that doesn't work. And I'm in the middle of the night, like, oh my God. (laughs) So now it's like almost a year later after I handed that draft in and I'm just about, no, it's so dangerous to say close to done, but I'm, the end is in sight of this second draft that feels like this is the draft. And I hope I'm like, it's like maybe early 2023. That would be my hope. And he's, he's in a new place. He, um, without, if, so I'll say to anyone, if you haven't read any of the books and you don't like spoilers, <laughs> but um, he's, he gets a fellowship. 
he gets very upset and he takes all of his sadness and he pours it into a book. It's like the reader becomes the writer and he needs an editor. So there's a woman staying in his basement. You can imagine how she got there and she becomes kind of his editor and she doesn't, you know, she doesn't make it, but he's sitting with a book. So he applies to a Harvard fellowship because he needs access to that world. And he learns a bit about the author who's running the fellowship and he gets to Harvard and then he meets his fellows. And the book is very much about Joe, not only being a writer and having all like someone who's already so anxious and like emotionally constipated to begin with is now sitting around people who are published writers and they're supposed to be equals. And Joe is not good at being an equal. And uh, it's really, it's, I'm really excited about it. Very excited to learn more about it and, of course, read it. And, of course, there'll be a scene where Jay goes on the Sarah O'Connell show and speaks about his book. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then he just hopes that you can't hear what's going on in the other room. Yeah. Exactly. I'll ask him the same question about the what's in the basement as well, and I'll probably get yes. a different answer. <laughs> So season three of you is, of course, out now on Netflix. Season four has already been announced. What do you know about it? They just went into the room recently, and I don't know what they've said. So I'm hesitant to say any of the plans, but um, we're, you know, like, you'll see. Um, yeah. Joe is like, as we know, I'll just say like he's a reader and it's they're both a bit like very you know book centric stories coming up have you planned how joe's story might eventually conclude or even how many books you might want to write or are you just sort of happy exploring his adventure one book at a time to see where it goes right it's funny like i when i was writing the first one i just had that like i must write another feeling and I didn't know that when I started and I didn't have any map or plan, but it was just so, so addictive. And I was like, okay, I love doing this. And then when I was writing the second one, I was dying to do more and had like specific, such specific plans. Mm -hmm. And then when I started writing, when I got to write two more, I'm in that addictive place now where yes, I hope to do more. I feel like this like book that I'm writing right now, like it, it's a reset by the end it's kind of a reset and I'm like oh my god imagine like the possibilities now so I hope to do more but I'm like well, I'm gonna finish this one and <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah I hope you do lots more of them too could you ever have guessed or predicted how huge it'd be not only the books but the show as well how has it changed your life I know that Stephen King praised your book as well yes that was a while that's all I was thinking like that was this month I think like I'm bad at years but like eight many years ago and that was great and I feel like that was the biggest thrill because I grew up in a house full of Stephen King books he's Stephen King like and I didn't know that that was happening and it was just a very cool like kind of mind-blowing thing of like oh my god like people because already like people had been reading it and having these really passionate reactions and I had readers that were like writing to me a lot and just so worked up and feeling it in their bones and then he did it was and so that was a nice thing for them so that's what's been nice over the years of like, I have this dedicated, amazing group of readers and to watch them like go through, to go through all of it with them of like where they've been screaming about Joe for years. And now they're like, now the world is here. Like, you know what I'm, and, and with the show, like it's, I never imagined, I, I imagine like more people loving it, if that makes mm. sense, but not like, you never, I don't think you would ever imagine that it's going to have like a Marvel vibe of like in that cultural awareness way. Like I'm surprised when I run into someone and they know you, you know, it's. Yeah. It's a huge thing. And every time there's a new season out, I see it all over social media and it's, you know, advertised yeah. in the magazines and obviously really heavily featured on Netflix as well. Yes. Yeah. And it goes back to like when I was first writing and two of my best friends came over and it was like that drunk middle of the night thing. And I read them the first few pages and they both loved it. And that was one of those good early like book writing feelings of like, okay, I'm, I'm not crazy. There's something here. Like they're, they're getting it. They, they hooked into him. So that's great. And then when you see that happen, like with people watching a show about him and more people reading the books, it's like, oh, okay. It's nice to feel like, I don't know, like we are, we all do have certain things in common when it comes to storytelling. 
and character. Absolutely. Yeah. We don't want to be him or think he's a good person, but we're interested in him. Exactly. Here's a question that I ask every guest on the Sarah O'Connell show. Can you tell me a fun fact about you, something we may not know, a hobby, a party trick, something like that? Yes. Um, uh, yeah, I, uh, you said party trick. Yeah, <laughs> that's one of those <clears throat> self-conscious things that I've never had a party trick. But um, yes, I knew you were going to ask this. And I had a... <laughs> Um, well, when I was, when I was a little kid, I was in the movie One Crazy Summer and you can see the back of me. And that was here, in, on, you know, where I grew up in Cape Cod. And I'm like, it's not the most fun fact in the world, but it's the one on the top of my head right now, because also I've been writing about Joe being on the Cape. So, yeah. And now, of course, you also write Providence, which has also been picked up as a TV show and it's going to be on the Peacock streaming service. Conveniently, Peacock's just come over to the UK as well. It's available oh, on Sky. Can you tell us about it for anyone that hasn't read the book yet? It's a supernatural story. What can they expect? Yes, for me, Peacock, like <laughs> Providence is the, for me, it's the story of like, it's a young couple coming of age and an older couple like, tr- like that didn't do it properly. And I loved it. I was looking at 40 and I was like, oh, this time in life is interesting when you start to think of like your life as a thing that happened. And I wanted to get people like who are just getting started in a book with people who are like going toward the end. And then I have this aversion to supernatural things. So I also almost like wanted to to see if I could come up with something like that and pull it off because it was like, why does why does it bother me so much? And so, yeah, it was like an, it's a, an experimental coming of age horror of love story and it's in development we'll see what happens but the book is out there it's by the creators of you is that correct yes it's the same team and so it's like it's the same thing I feel like you like the process it it takes forever and then and then suddenly out of nowhere it's here so we'll see I'm like trying not to ask too many questions you know because I can't (laughs) wait I always do the opposite I ask too many questions it's kind of one of my the first time and I finally was like you know, especially like knowing that business a little, like kind of talking to myself, like, yeah, you know, these things take, take time. So yes. <laughs> Have you got any tips to anybody that is dreaming of becoming a writer themselves one day? Yes. I would, I would say like, don't like, don't be afraid to fail. I think that's the most important thing. Cause when I look at like the early, the earliest stuff that I did, either I was sending things out because I, I was afraid this is as good as they could be and way too early, or I was spending too much time on things and not moving on. So I feel like get to know yourself. And if something is absolutely terrible, but you can't stop thinking about it, don't judge it. Just go back into it and ask yourself and talk to yourself. Like a lot of you was me writing down what's wrong with this. And from that, or what is it I want to do here? And from that, a lot of story and dialogue and characters emerge. So talk to yourself. That's very good advice. Now, can you tell me some of your favorite books, ones that you perhaps loved growing up or ones that you're really enjoying at the moment? Yes. Um, well, growing up, I feel like that book that like got to me as a writer, as a teenager was American Psycho. And yeah, it's a, and that's a book like I was just, I, it's on my mind because my nephews were just here and talking about the movie. And I'm like, no, like you have to read the book. Like <laughs> it's, you know, it's a book that you have to, and I was going to put them in the basement, but I didn't. But um. Um, the Berenstain Bears are also on my mind lately because of Succession, my favorite show in the world. And I loved those. I loved those books. Charlotte and Charles was a favorite kids book. And recently, like this year, I loved Chasing the Boogie Band by Richard Chismar. I don't know if you read that, but for me, it's this. That. It's amazing. It's a mashup. It's one of those books. It's so it's so its own entity that it's almost hard to talk about because it's it's part like journalism story part true crime part love story part it's a a lot of parts meshing together down to the last page I was just transported by that book I really loved it and I have a new Sarah Pinborough here that I'm very excited about that I'm like when I finish this book I get to sit with that so well thank you for those recommendations I'm gonna have to go and get all of them and then take a week or so off and catch up I know I need I'm looking like there are so many books I, I feel like we should if I ran the world we would get like reading week months of once a week once a month where like you couldn't do anything else like there was no social media no work and some weeks you'd read one book some weeks you'd read five of them but you'd have the time just to read Oh, see, I make this time by purposefully interviewing authors so that I can call it my work and then I can just sit down and read 
Perfect. Yeah. yeah <laughs> yes. <laughs> Always a good idea. Now, can you tell me what you're working on next? Are you very much focused on U4? Yeah. Right now it's U4, U4. Like that's the thing that's living largest in my mind. I'm working on a couple of other things and I have a draft and a half of another book that I had put aside to write the two more Joe books. And I'm, I'll be getting back to that. And that's a book from a woman's perspective. So I'm excited. Yeah. I'm excited about that. And she's, yeah, she's not Joe, but she's not, not Joe. And wow. Yeah. Well, I'm very intrigued to learn more about that as well. Yes. So you, you're going to have to come back on and then we're going to have to talk about that book when, when you're able yes. to. Yes. I'm like, this is the reward for all of the hours alone, like feeling crazy and staring at screen. <laughs> yes. This is nice to talk to you. <laughs> and so my final question is, have you got any messages for people watching the Sarah O'Connell show and your fans around the world? Okay. Sarah, it's, I'm, Sarah really has a good conversation with each person she has here. And if you've been sitting here You've seen me say, oh my God, you did your research. And yeah, so check out the rest of Sarah's episodes because she didn't just do that for me. She does that for all her guests. I do indeed. And I love all of your work. It's been an absolute pleasure doing that. Caroline Kepnes, thank you so much for your time today and coming on my show. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you to everybody watching at home. Be sure to share, subscribe, give this video a big thumbs up and leave lots of lovely comments. I'll see you all again soon for another episode of the Sarah O'Connell Show. Bye.